Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, a warm welcome from wherever you are listening in. I hope you can hear and see me. A very warm welcome to our seminar on trade union rights in the global economics industry, the case of Indonesia. This is the third in a series of seminars recently on um, these issues as part of the Make ICT Fair project. My name is Dave Gorman and I'm Director of Social Responsibility and Sustainability at the University of Edinburgh. And it's my job to be your moderator for today. Just before we get going, I'm just going to ask Charlotte uh, to jump in and just speak about some of the practicalities. So over to Charlotte. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, also, um, in the name of Katapa and the KU Leuven, who are also co-hosting this um, webinar. Yeah, I wanted to share some uh, practicalities for today because, uh, yeah, we have three keynote speakers and questions can be asked to them during the during the chat box. So you cannot unmute yourself as a, a participant. So please uh, write the questions you have in the chat box towards questions. So you can click on um, yeah, on the name questions and then my colleague will collect uh, these questions and we will try to ask them during the panel conversation we have at the end of this um, webinar. So, and please, if you, for example, have a uh, particular question to Jeroen, first put the name of Jeroen and then double point and then you can, you can put your uh, question. Um, I have to repeat that this session will be recorded. So if you don't like, please switch off your camera. Um, I also have to say that uh, Iris is uh, drawing, she's making a graphic drawing uh, during this session, so this drawing will be shared after uh, to you too. Um, and then, yeah, we will start also the presentation with a poll, you can vote and then we will go to uh, the results. And at the end, you will receive the recordings, the drawing, the evaluation form, and also a blog spot. So in a few days, that will all will be uh, sent to uh, the participants. So enjoy this uh, yeah. webinar and I hope an interesting debate can be uh, launched. Over to Dave again. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, for those practicalities. Yes, just a warm welcome again, everybody. As I said at the start, my name is Dave Gorman. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for today. So my basic job is to um, keep things moving and make sure we have time for questions at the end. We've got an excellent panel and I'm going to introduce them in a, in a second. Just to remind you, as Charlotte was saying, we're recording this. Um, also, if you're a tweeter, if you're one of those people who likes Twitter, then we are tweeting, and you can use the hashtag MakeICTFair, and also hashtag SDGs for Sustainable Development Goals. And Katapa will also be tweeting, I think, the event. Uh, and, and again, if you're a, uh, one who likes to tweet, then at, if you look for at Katapa, underscore Belgica. Um, I think everybody's automatically muted, but if not, please do mute so we can't hear your, your dog in the background or, or the birds tweeting. We're, we're absolutely delighted as uh, Edinburgh University to be one of 11 partners in Make ICT Fair. Uh, it's coming to a close now, uh, but this has been, I think, an excellent project funded by the European Union. So my, my thanks to the European Union and also to Catapa, uh, to KU Leuven, uh, Institute for Sustainable Metals and Minerals and Fair ICT Flanders, just for the efforts in putting these seminars together. Uh, I live in the UK and so I'm fortunate in many ways and one of those ways is we have the right to organise, but the right to organise is often, as many of you will know, is denied to workers, particularly in the electronics industry. And so what we're going to explore um, over the course of the next hour and a half is um, those rights as they apply in Indonesia. So the format is, and you can see it on the screen, I'll finish in a minute and I will introduce each of the speakers, give a little biography for them before we get going. Then Jeroen is gonna start and speak for around 20 minutes and I'll give him a warning with five minutes to go. Um, then Harry will speak for similarly about 20 minutes and I'll give him a warning at five minutes. We'll then hear a response from Fami uh, for about 15 minutes. Uh, with some time, we hope for um, Harry and Jeroen to then respond to what they've just heard. And we really want to get to questions by about 10 past 11. <clears throat> so as Charlotte said, please do keep the questions coming. 
um, and we'll get through as many of those questions as we possibly can. So I'm going to hand over to you in a second, but before I do, just let me give you a little bit of background on each of our, our speakers to, to warm you up for the, for the panel, because I think we have an excellent panel. So Jeroen Merck is a, holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Sussex, Brighton, and he's also a research fellow at the University of Edinburgh, and we've been working on this project together now for three years, I think it is. Um, his research interests are concerned with analysing the shifting nature of worker-employer relations uh, within national, local and global supply chain contexts. He's also interested in the role of ethical standards as embedded in codes of conduct and other voluntary instruments. And the combined, but it says here, uneven emergence of cross-border networks of NGOs and trade bodies keeping businesses accountable for labour rights violations. So a warm welcome to Rune, and you'll hear from him in a moment. Secondly, we've got Harry Negruho, who's a lecturer at the Department of Sociology at Universitas Indonesia. He's a PhD candidate at the Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Development Sociology um, at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And he's currently a member of one of the editors of uh, Global Dialogue, International Sociological Association, and the Maziak Rakat, sorry, Journal Sociology. His major research interests are labor, social movements, the politics of representation, and social exclusion. So a warm welcome to Harry as well. And then finally, we have um, Fami Padimbang, who's a labor activist based in Indonesia. His recent publications include an edited book, Resistance on the Continent of Labor, Strategies and Initiatives of Labor Organizing in Asia. He coordinated a regional research to support the struggle of some, some uh, workers in Asia. And he's also published an edited book, Labor Rights in High-Tech Electronics, Case Studies of Workers' Struggles in Samsung Electronics and its Asian Suppliers. So again, a warm welcome to FAMI. And as you can see, there's some real expertise amongst our panel members. So with no further ado, I'm going to go on mute and I'm going to hand over to Yeroon. And you won't hear from me unless I feel that you're, you're running out of time. So over to you. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, can you? Yeah, it's there. And um, can this now? It's my computer is going black. But I can start already. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Katapa, for uh, all the organizational work behind this. Thank you, uh, Harry and uh, Fami, for participating also in this uh, panel. Um, in my presentation, I will uh, introduce the research I've done with, um, with Harry in Indonesia, but also give some global context to trade union rights in the, in the global electronics industry. So I will, I will focus first on the number of, of barriers at a global level of, or at a general level that workers around the world uh, face when they try to, uh, to organize. And then I will start with introducing the, the situation in, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, and how we will take over from that. And then Fami will bring, his, bring in his perspective and give some comments on our, our presentation as well. So um, I'm going to try to ask the following questions. What barriers to trade unions exist at a global level? How does Indonesia stand out when it comes to trade union rights, um, specifically in the electronics industry? What barriers do unions still face in Indonesia? And what can we learn from the Indonesia case? Um, so our conclusion uh, will be that Indonesia provides a few developments to be positive about, mm -hmm. but there are still many barriers that, that unions face there. So we argue that if you compare Indonesia with uh, countries uh, in Southeast Asia, like Malaysia or the Philippines, or China, Vietnam, uh, then there are certainly things that, that, that could be seen as positive, uh, but still 
as as um, as we will show, there are still many barriers to 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 overcome for workers to achieve really a decent a decent workplace. Um, so, first, a, a general introduction on on trade union rights, and I, I think most of this will be familiar. But trade union rights are often known as enabling rights or process rights. Uh, they are, of course, associated with ILO conventions, 87 and 98, but they also come back in all kinds of um, international human rights standards. Um, and the argument of enabling rights or process rights is that if, if, uh, if unions exist, if a collective bargaining machinery is uh, in place, if there is an effective dispute and complaints mechanism, workers themselves would be able to um, monitor workplace conditions and protect their own rights. So in these places, in these conditions, it would be very rare to find child labor, forced labor, excessive overtime, um, poverty wages, uh, sexual harassment on a structural basis. All these things are rare in unionized workplaces. But of course, in electronics. Um, um, Jeroen, is it possible that your screen is not moving? We, we still see the, the, the first slides. I'm oh. not sure if, if this is the intention? Uh, no, I, I, am, I am moving them. But okay, no, we, we can't see this. You can see this? No, we, we only see like, yeah, the first slide, like webinar trade union rights. That's strange. I put on my, uh, put off my other screen. Maybe this helps. Um, yeah, now it works. Yeah, now we see the, the slide you see now is trade union rights. But can you uh, switch it to yeah to big screen to PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now it works. Not yet. Well, we we still see trade union rights, but we don't see the full screen yet. I have my full screen on my computer. So um, no, then I think you have to. So I should probably use this one, but then you can you can only see uh, you also see the other elements of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah. if I if I put it but on share or, or uh, on on the PowerPoint, then you don't see it, right? I, yeah, I think you're sharing the wrong uh, screen, but it doesn't matter. We we can follow now. Sorry to interrupt you, but it was important uh, to. Uh, this. Okay. Uh, so what should I do now? Continue with this one? This one you can see, right? Did I, I'm moving it. Yeah, I, I think really, as long as we can see it and it's moving, I would, I would carry on. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how otherwise to, to solve it and make it as big as possible. So, okay. Uh, sorry about this. Um, so I was I was at um, arguing that that in in workplaces where you have trade unions, uh, they can often monitor their own workplace, but that this in electronics is very rare, uh, and that the number of workplaces in the electronics industry, especially at hardware assembling manufacturing is, is uh, very small uh, around the world. Um, and I think we can here distinguish between three different types of barriers on a, on a general or, or global level. First is uh, um, the way the industry is organized, which we discuss as um, neo-Taylorism. Then there are all kinds of political barriers and there's corporate opposition to trade union rights. Now, uh, but now, so neo, neo Taylorism is a bit of a technical term, um, but it refers to the way the global electronics industry is organized at a 
at, 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 a, at a global level. Um, and it's a term used by industrial sociologists and political economists. And it refers, of course, to a kind of um, uh, workplace regime where uh, tasks are broken down in micro movements uh, and, and, and takes place in, um, in very flexible um, manners. Uh, it also refers to the way the, the industry is organized through global outsourcing so that a lot of brands outsource uh, the labor intensive moments to uh, contractors around the world. Um, and these, these, these changes are, are based on uh, just in time and, 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 and speed, which in turn, I, basically they, they externalize uh, risks to contractors and the contractors externalize the risk to the workforce. So the, the, the type of employment regimes that you find are based on, on precarious work, very long working hours, low wages, and uh, unsafe working conditions. Uh, it also means that these contractors have a, a huge interest in uh, keeping unions repressed. Uh, at the same time, this is not just on the workplace level, but also on, on a national or political level. So most of this production of labor intensive production takes place in, uh, in countries where uh, worker rights are repressed. So this can be called a regime of, of control. Uh, here trade union, we will discuss this in, in a minute, but there's also besides that, that rights are repressed, there is little social protection for workers uh, when they get unemployed or uh, get retired or those kind of things. And there are a few social mechanisms to regulate uh, labor relations at, at the national level. Um, so we can, we can look at a number of political barriers. Um, and in this map, if uh, you can probably... So, sorry, Jeroen, we, we can't see a map. I, I think it's again the same uh, issue uh, going on. Um, Should I stop sharing and start sharing? Maybe. Yeah, I think it makes sense, yeah. Okay. Mm. Can you see it now? Yeah, now we see the map. Yeah, again. Okay. Can you also see it when I, I make it as a little... So I think we, we actually missed the previous slide then, but yeah, okay. it's okay. We can, we can go. I think I, 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 I think I continue from here. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, Sorry, so, it was important. No, no, I don't see that because I look at the, at the PowerPoint, right? Um, so at this map, um, it, in terms of political rights, it's, uh, we, we can, um, uh, we can we can first look at the number of countries that ratified uh, the conventions on trade union rights, Convention 87 and Convention 98. Um, and uh, the, 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 the countries that are colored on the map are basically the countries where uh, most uh, electronics production takes place, especially in Southeast Asia and East Asia. So there about 70% of all manufacturing uh, happens. Uh, as you can see on the map, it's also the area where, where trade union rights are, uh, are most poorly uh, protected according to the International Trade Union um, Confederation uh, that, that publishes every year an index on trade union rights. Um, you can also look at the, at the number of countries that uh, ratified uh, convention 98 and 87. So it, although globally 155 countries have ratified uh, 87 on the on freedom of association, um, this is not a global uh, universal recognition of that, right? Because China, India, the US, Vietnam, all countries that 
are very important in terms of electronics production have, uh, have not ratified it. And even if they had ratified it, like Indonesia and the Philippines would do recognize these rights, the, of course, uh, recognition on paper does not necessarily uh, translate into um, uh, implementation. So in these countries too, there are still uh, a lot of other, other problems. Um, it's basically like, like for China, where most electronics production takes place, there is only one one trade union, Vietnam, the same that is state sanctioned. So it's it's a very complex situation in terms of trade union rights, uh, but also in other other most other countries, the um, the rights are very poorly uh, protected. So if you look at um, how the ITUC, International Trade Union Confederation, um, ranks them, they all get um, uh, four or five, uh, five reflects the uh, extreme violations of, 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 of trade union rights. Um, then on the corporate level, so this one, uh, can you still see my PowerPoint? Okay, cool. Uh, there is also a long tradition in the electronics industry of corporate corporate opposition to trade union rights. Um, this, um, this is partly explained that much of the industry is, is uh, controlled by US firms who have a more traditional uh, kind of opposition to trade union rights. Uh, and of course that much of the production is outsourced to contractors in countries where these rights are neither, neither protected. Um, uh, in this in this um, complex um, figure, you find uh, benchmarks by uh, corporate human rights benchmark and know the chain, which are uh, both trying to uh, rank electronic companies on how they perform, not just on trade human rights, but on all human rights and know the chain, especially on forced labor. But they also look at how these companies uh, look at uh, trade union rights. And if we just take no the chain benchmark, then you can see in freedom of association that all companies, basically all uh, main companies, big companies here, um, score zero points on, on freedom of association. Some companies are working on worker engagement. Which sorry, was, sorry to interrupt, that's your five minutes to go. Five minutes, okay. I, I, um, so the base conclusion is there is a lot of, um, and there are, exist a lot of barriers uh, to trade unions, also from the corporate uh, position. I think Fami can, can say, will say a little bit more on this later. So the electronics industry in Indonesia uh, is, um, it started basically in the late, late 1980s when the regime um, started to try to uh, copy the success of some of the Asian tigers and, and move to an export-led industrialization um, strategy. So they started in light, late 1980s. In the 1990s, they succeeded in attracting quite a lot of, uh, especially Japanese companies to set up assembling sites in Indonesia. Um, but Indonesia is compared to uh, most neighboring countries, still a, a marginal, uh, marginal electronics producing country. Uh, in the map, you can see that the main uh, production sites are, are located. So the most of them are around Jakarta and the industrial zones um, close neighboring it. And another important uh, electronics producing site is Batam, that is opposite to Singapore. So it's basically a low cost assembling site for, for many uh, Singaporean uh, companies, which is a very important uh, global electronics producing country. Um, so far, Indonesia has not been very popular by the 
really big contract manufacturers like Foxconn. Although in recent years, uh, these, these contractors are looking at, to Indonesia as a potential site for investment. So probably in the next few years, this will, uh, this will, 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 will change. Um, I have here just to see how marginal Indonesia is compared to the other countries in the region. You can see the two uh, export of components, electronic components and, and final parts. And you can easily see that China dominates everything. Uh, and then the other countries are in the region are still fairly much bigger than, than Indonesia. In the graphic, you can see that the export uh, from Indonesia is increased until 2010, 11, and then decreased again. So my question for Harry, uh, and basically also for the, the research that we have done, is, to, uh, to, is there a connection between the strength of the, of the worker movement in Indonesia and the decrease of, of export? Um, and that, that connection is very difficult to make, uh, but it, it, it's, there might be something that we, sh we should look into in more detail at, at one point. So very short before Harry can take over, because I think I have just a minute left, maybe. Um, the, the Indonesia has gone through an important transformation after 1998. So it ended in three decades of authoritarian regime and union repression in which the old union from the 1960s was basically completely destroyed. After 1998, uh, the country recognized Convention 87 and 98 and also incorporated that in the national law. It led to a very vibrant trade union uh, movement with a huge growth of the number of unions. Uh, but also still important barriers continue to exist. So one of these barriers, and Harry will continue on this, is the, is the use of flexible work and contract work, uh, the, the, the fragmentation of the union movement, uh, the political decentralization that the, 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 the country has gone through after uh, 1998, which also led to all kinds of shadow state powers, as we argue that, let's say, illegitimate uh, forces that gain control of, of important parts of the uh, political apparatus. Um, and also the, the legacy of the authoritarian regime that also restricts unions in a way to operate in a way that would be more functional and effective for, for workers in the, in the industry. Um, so, so I think Harry will take over from here. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeroen. And I meant to say at the start that we, we do have time for questions. Jeroen's kindly said though, and you can see his email there. If we don't get to a question that you've got for him, he's very happy to answer it afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, Jeroen, can I remind people just as we're switching over presentations to go to Harry that um, if people have got questions, please do put them in the in the chat box and we will we will gather them. So thank you very much, um, Jeroen, and straight over to Harry. Um, okay, um, hi Dave. Can you see this uh, moving? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. We can, yes, excellent, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you Dave and Jaron um, for this opportunity, this in this interesting um, webinar 
Um, hi everyone. Um, my presentation will be about the findings of our research that Jerun and I uh, conducted in, in one industrial region in Indonesia. That is Bekasi. Uh, Jerun just, met, just uh, showed the map, so it's close to Jakarta. So actually we are studying on two industrial regions. Uh, one is Bekasi and the other one is uh, Batam in uh, Sumatra, close to Singapore and Malaysia. But uh, the COVID pandemic uh, has interrupted and we should delay for it. <clears throat> so, um, so in this session, I will just focus on, on our finding, finding in, in Bekasi industrial region. But of course, it will not limit it. It will, it will not be limited to that. Some aspects of national uh, conditions will be also presented. And Bekasi is, is the largest industrial region uh, where a lot of companies are integrated are integrated into global supply chain, including the electronic industries. So it uh, it has become a symbol of uh, the revival of uh, labor movements uh, in Indonesia since the reformation era. And workers in uh, electronic industries played an important role in this case. So having this condition, we, we, we raised uh, some questions. How is the practice of uh, trade union rights in electronic industries in Bekasi after the Re reformation era? And to what, to what extent does it represent a successful tran transformation uh, of trade unionism and how are the local and national and global contexts are interrelated and affect the practices and the development of uh, trade uh, union rights. So the answer of this question will help to cover the issues that were mentioned by uh, Jerun uh, just now. <clears throat> so then um, um, in the study we uh, conducted uh, both qualitative methods and a quantitative survey. And for the case study, we took four factories in different position within the supply chain um, with different country uh, origin of investment. And we assumed that these differences might be related with a different kind of factory regime uh, that affect the labor conditions and the practice of trade union rights. So the composition that we select uh, two is, uh, Asian companies from tier one, and another two companies from lower three, uh, uh, lower, uh, the tier two and tier three. Um, <clears throat> and we drew 200 respondents uh, using a, a combination between quota and snowball sampling. So, and also for the qualitative, we interview some uh, union leaders, uh, national union, local union leaders, national union leaders, labor NGO academicians. And for this presentation, um, I have um, five sections that I want to present. The first one is the phase of the union transformation. The second one is the paradox of changing labor regime. The second, the third one is the union responses and then corporate responses and political context. Okay, I will start with the first one, the, the, the phase of uh, in the union transformation. As Jeroen just mentioned a little bit, uh, the past era of transformation, the, sorry, the past era of authoritarian regime is always an important historical context if we want to understand the existing threat unionism currently. Uh, in the authoritarian regime, there was only a single union that was formed by the corporate state which emphasis the economic growth through depoliticization and oppressive industrial relations. And the union, the name of the union is SPSI, as you see in the yellow box. So it really represents how unitarist approach uh, was applied uh, by the past regime. And in current democratic era, the major unions in electronic industries were partly born born from this union. And the metal union, the red, the red one uh, on the right, uh, on the right left, on the right hand side, is one of them. And it was established by the workers who seceded from the SPSI as the response of the workers to embrace the freedom of association. And um, 
under this democratic era, both unions are attempting to, to dismantle the legacy of past cultural and structural legacies. But the metal union seems to be able to transform themselves progressively uh, compared to SPSI that is still bound to bound by the legacy. So Terry Carraway, uh, an, an American political scientist, called this current SPSI as the legacy union. The, while the metal union can be regarded as the most successful transformation compared to almost all unions that split from the legacy union. It has more than 200,000 members. Uh, it's still smaller than the legacy union, but they are more militant and well organized. They are also continuously moderni modernizing the organization and building extensive uh, international network. So uh, the development of this uh, union can be more or less uh, represented by the general trend of unionization in Indonesia. As you can see, the, the, growth, is, uh, the growth of union is pretty impressive since the national uh, economic and political transition. It's like uh, exploding from just one union to 100 uh, of unions at the uh, national level. And similar trends is also found in the development of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, so in, in terms of numbers, the progress seems uh, amazing, at least compared to the other South East Asian countries or other developing countries. However, um, the Indonesian economic and political transition in 1998 and afterwards has been also characterized by the integration of this country deeply into global economy, especially in order to recover from the effect of the uh, economic crisis. So in, in relations to the labor conditions, this economic restructuring and democratization require not only the freedom of association, but also a new labor uh, regulation that support a flexible labor market that has been a popular, a popular creed in Asia after the end of crisis. So, um, uh, so the result was uh, a labor reform that produce a set of new labor regulation. The regulations are more protective uh, compared, to, compared to the authoritarian labor law in many aspects. But the shift of labor regime from state control to market control create some paradoxes. That is why by the regulation, by this regulation, uh, the use of flexible labor, mar lab the use of flexible labor, like short-term contract workers, outsourced workers, increased rapidly, reducing the use of permanent wor uh, workers. This is actually quite common uh, in many other sectors, or maybe in, in also in other countries. But the problem is um, that it is not only the use of flexible labor but also the practice of extreme flexibilization, as we found also in our study. So um, in our study, uh, the practice of such extreme flexibilization is evident in electronic industries. Our survey found uh, a number of flexible labor uh, were employed longer than the regulation standard. Look at the red box uh, on, on the left, uh, the 10%. And the extreme practice, the, another extreme practice is also, is also seen on the use of the interns. This category of employment has been abused by the employments, by the employers to be a regular workers, doing similar tasks as permanent workers, but receiving much longer uh, sorry, much lower wages and lacking all benefits. So this phenomena has spread ex extensively in electronic industries in Bekasi. And for the union, the increased number of flexible labor reduces the union membership because union depends a lot on the permanent 
uh, workers. Uh, another paradox is wages. Before 2015, the workers enjoyed, enjoyed wage negotiations and it makes Bekasi uh, become the region with the highest wage increase in Indonesia, even compared to Jakarta. But this freedom uh, has ended as the central government made a new regulation that determined the minimum wage based on inflation. So it undermines the bargaining institution which determines in wage determination and reduce the significant role of uh, union. And um, so while unions are facing such increasing threats, they also find uh, uh, some internal problems. This is actually the paradox of freedom of association. So the increase of uh, unionization is not followed by the increase of membership uh, because of the flexibility and also union competition. So in short, uh, the unions, <clears throat> including also those in electronic industries, are dealing with those serious, threat, serious threats from all sides while they are trying to establish their stronghold. Um, so how, how does the union responses? Uh, trade union re responses by using various ways and excesses. Beside, uh, besides besides negotiating through official labor institutions like wage council, bipartite and tripartite institution, workers also use uh, various alternative channels. Since almost all workers protests on extreme flexibilization have been overlooked by the government at various levels and the use of this kind of labor was uncontrollable. So the unions took some radical counter collective action. Uh, this is the period uh, in which the workers' radical, radicalism increased significantly and, and the role of the unions in electronic industries stand out, stands out. For instance, during 2012, uh, workers conducted a lot of uh, factory raids. The media covered this extensively. Thousands of workers went out from the factories riding motorbikes, as you see the, in, the, in the picture behind. They overrun the factories, which was regarded practicing extreme flexible labor, labor and violating the labor law. The, the labor law. One of the famous uh, factory raids was the, the one directed to Samsung, the largest non-unionized electronic industry in Bekasi. So by doing this, the metal union claimed that within four months, they have forced the factories in Bekasi to take on 23,000 temporary workers as permanent workers. SPSI, which is uh, which was in, inspired by this metal union actions, also did the same thing, resulting in the change of the status of thousands of temporary workers. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, Abu uh, Fahmi, Fahmi's colleague calls this factory rate as a provincial way of law enforcement. So uh, besides these three actions, um, they also conducted another another way by making experiment in electoral politics. This is an important and interesting issue, but uh, it needs a longer session to discuss this. Uh, but in this brief presentation, I should give a glance that um, workers in electronic industries have been able to mobilize their own base, organizing union as a political machine, independent from foot buying politics and resulting a successful political gain. This is, a, this is a success, successful union political experience, uh, ex experiment, uh, despite continuously internal and external challenges. So how do the employers respond to this situation? I would like to, I would like briefly show you uh, what we found in the workplace at the electronic industries. I'm using the concept uh, from Michael Borway, an American sociologist, the factory regime. Uh, for describing how the company 
responses uh, to respond to 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 um, union activism, uh, whether hegemonic or despotic. Hegemonic refers to the management strategy uh, to accommodate and persuade workers in order to subjugate the workers and trade unions, while despotic refers to the opposite. <clears throat> so our our, uh, our survey found surprisingly that all foreign companies that we surveyed, whether whatever the, their position in the in the tiers, tend to adopt such hegemonic way in dealing with trade union activism. Uh, but maybe uh, Fahmi we have uh, different findings uh, on this, and only the union uh, of uh, and only the union um, of sorry the 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 I mean only the the uh, the company of with the Indonesian owner ownership, which was despotic. But probably this is not simply related to the country origin of capital ownership. Instead, it might be related to what, to, to what extent does the company may have a degree of control in market competition that give them a, a significant capital, capital to support a peaceful industrial relations. Because I think most of employers uh, do not want to get involved in long conflicts or protected, protected conflict as it would make them uh, vulnerable in market competition. So in, ad in addition to these economic sides, uh, it is also necessary to look at the political dimension. This aspect is always essential uh, in understanding the labor situation in Indonesia, even since the colonial era. At least there are two interrelated major factors that become the barriers for the development of trade unionism in, in, in this country. Uh, the first one is the effect of decentralization, uh, as uh, mentioned by Jerome. And also the second one is the elite oligarchies that hijack the development of democracy in Indonesia. Michel Ford published uh, an interesting book on this. Decentralization gives a, contradict a contradictory uh, effect on labor. On the one hand, it provides an opportunity for the workers to access dialogues and to settle the labor problems with local authorities. But on the other hand, the access is the access is actually controlled by the local power holders, like political parties or local strongmen, who took benefit from the democratic system. So the benefits that the workers get depends on the political exchange between the workers and the, lo the local oligarchs. So that's why the problems of like uh, weak labor inspection remain to exist. Similar situation is the condition at the national level. Uh, and this is the case of current hot issue uh, of the omnibus law uh, of the bill of job on job creation. That is the bill that the ruling government and almost all political parties are endorsing, but all workers strongly against it. Because Eric, it's, it's, it's uh, I forgot to give you a five minute warning, apologies. Yeah, just a couple more minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, no problem. Almost done. Yeah, because it's, it's simply deepening a radical flexibilization. So the unions now are planning to conduct uh, uh, a national strike across the country next week to refuse the bill. So uh, finally, um, the, my concluding remarks are um, in comparison to many other many Asian countries, the union's uh, achievement in, uh, in two decades are remarkable. But uh, there are a lot of political barriers, uh, which is uh, actually important in this case, uh, uh, including also, of course, the, the barriers from the, the, the <clears throat> side of the companies, which is actually related to one to another, that the neoliberal agencies constantly en encourage mar market flexibility, increasing precariousness and eroding uh, the union power. And uh, also the agenda of labor and trade union protection also is also vulnerable to increasing regional competition, as uh, Jeroen has uh, described about the competition between uh, countries in, in East Asia, and companies which are marginalized within the structure of supply chain, like, we, like uh, what we, we have found, are the most vulnerable workplace in, uh, for the labor protection. And national and local 
elites or oligarchies are significant barriers to create a protective, uh, protective labor policy as they control the representation, uh, representation system. And the, the, uh, the last one, the most recent uh, condition is that the impact of COVID-19 pandemic might be another critical future threat to the extreme economic uh, slowdown. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harry. The reason I forgot to give you a cue for five minutes because I was fascinated by that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you again. So with no further ado, we're going to keep moving. Um, so you've just heard from you and, and, and Harry and now Fami is going to respond. So with a bit of luck, uh, we'll get that presentation up and running with no technical issues. Yes, there we go. So um, straight over to Fami. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Fami, we can, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank, thank, thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, findings from Yerun and Hari Richards. Uh, and hopefully it's to be finalized uh, very soon because it's interrupted uh, by the COVID pandemic. Um, yeah, uh, most of the arguments that uh, explained by Yerun and Hari, it's, um, they are very sound and uh, Sorry, technical problem. Uh, all of them I agree. Uh, and uh, you would explain about the trade unions uh, enabled by the fact that freedom of associations is ratified in Indonesia, meaning trade unions and the workers are able to monitor the workplace. But of course, uh, as uh, Yerun also mentioned that uh, in practice, uh, the right to organize and the right to collective bargain is often, very, very often denied. And union busting is actually a uh, general practice. So sometime uh, activists here in Indonesia also reflect that what is the point of having uh, freedom of association ratified. Uh, see, for example, in Malaysia, it's it, the right to organize is limited. The migrants are not able to join the unions, but actually the same problems are still uh, uh, having by, by most of the, the workers. I'm going to uh, also comment on Harry's uh, por uh, presentation on the transformation of uh, metal workers unions uh, to what is now today. Uh, I think it's also important to mention that apart from the legacy union, uh, the SPSI, uh, where these unions, the legacy unions, is uh, still dominant in terms of the electronics and electric sector in terms of membership. And this, is the, uh, this union is the second largest after FSPMI. The me, FSP just, sorry to interrupt, yes. just to say I'm not sure yeah. if we have the same problem with slides as before. I don't know if you were... No, I haven't, I haven't moved. Okay. Okay. okay, just to comment first. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, the, I, think, I think it's also important to mention if, if, if SPMI is also or, originated from 
the SPSI, the legacy unions that uh, Hari mentioned. Yes, SPSI is the legacy union, uh, and they are also trying to, you know, to adapt with the situation uh, because of the intervention from some different actors, including the NGOs. And uh, also, we, we, we have to remember that uh, if SPMI inherits some of the, you know, old structural and organizational culture from uh, the past, uh, meaning it's, it's not, uh, it is still, you know, part of that sort of legacy union in, uh, in one way or another. So uh, that's, that's the reason why we, uh, at the ground, we've, we, we face dif different uh, difficulties and uh, different problems uh, when dealing with uh, 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 how the workers who suffer from the illness, occupational illness, can be uh, advocate, for example. Um, so, yeah, uh, of course, uh, I agree. Uh, now the FSPMI is the the, uh, the major unions, are very dynamic and very modern. Uh, they're trying to uh, challenge the uh, their old uh, ori uh, origins, uh, the SPSI. In fact, they are part of the they were they were part of the metal workers sector, a metal sector in the legacy union. So it split in 1999 after reformacy. Uh, it changed, but to some extent there are also, uh, we have to emphasize that they, they also uh, inherit some of the old structure uh, and old culture in the organization. So there are, there are uh, some problems uh, to give you some context uh, on how the problems uh, we are having now is still uh, remain. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm... Okay, uh, I'm going to move, uh, can, can you see my second slide? We can, yeah, thank you. Yes, okay. So, uh, I, I, uh, Freedom of associations is, has, uh, as explained by uh, two presenters, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, it's, it's also a, a social space. Uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, competition and struggle uh, of different actors. It is spatial arrangements that's shaped by social relations and also being produced by those relations. Uh, this is to say that, you know, different actors, including unions and corporations, uh, civil society also play uh, some roles. I, I want to highlight here that corporations, uh, like the companies uh, in electronic uh, sectors uh, in this context, they also play a major role in the uh, freedom of association space. They're trying to limit the space of the workers and the, the space of the labor unions. So the space or, or the freedom of association is also politically saturated. It's a full of uh, competitions and influence. I think this is, uh, 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 it it's, uh, makes sense for, for most of you. So let, let me show you the, uh, the image here, the second uh, slide about the trade union presence in selected large companies. Uh, just to you know, reinforce, uh, to agree what uh, Yerun and Hari presented about the barriers that uh, the workers and trade unions in Indonesia are still uh, facing. Here, uh, the research from Industry All in 2018, it shows a big companies, big corporations like Apple, Samsung, Foxconn, General Electric, Amazon, HP, Siemens, Alphabet, Microsoft, Hitachi, and, and Toshiba, Huawei, Dell, and mostly, mostly uh, denying uh, the 
the presence of the union, meaning they are, they are, they don't, they don't, you know, they are anti-union. They, uh, there are uh, often cases of union busting, and they try to uh, suppress the, the 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 workers and uh, to limit the space for for the workers to speak up. Uh, like you can see in uh, in this image uh, in the far right, the presence of the industry all. So FSPMI is part of the industry all, and this is the global unions. Uh, that's uh, one of the sectors is electronics, uh, one of the key sectors, and their uh, finding uh, it's it says that most of the large companies, including Apple and Samsung, are denying of the rights to collective bargain and rights to organize. Um, uh, that's your um, five minute warning. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll bring you uh, quickly on, I think, uh, very important issues about the occupational health and safety. This is, I think, to, to show you that with the limits or, and the barriers of the workers to organize, this come to the effect that even the occupational health and safety, which is very important issue at the workplace, is still still very under you know uh, reported and not attend uh, uh, neglected and uh, yeah. Here I I put a list of uh, very toxic and dangerous chemicals being used at the workplace: toluene, PVC, TCE and sort of uh, this uh, uh, very hazardous chemicals. Uh, if you can see my slide here, uh, it's called chemhat.org. Uh, uh, please note this, uh, you can check later uh, with the list of the chemicals. Uh, I put one of the chemical here, TCE. Uh, you can see the, the, the dangers, the, the effect of uh, these chemicals being used, it's very massively used in, in most of the electronic uh, production sites uh, here in Indonesia and everywhere. So it's, it's caused an uh, uh, increase of the risk of the cancer, that's for the long uh, term effect. And for short term effect, you can see it's a very acute uh, irritation of eye uh, and the skin and toxic to human and animal, of course. Uh, so I would see that electronic industry actually uh, as originally from uh, developed countries in North America and uh, in the Europe. It's now moving uh, over the years since uh, 70s and 80s and uh, to East Asia and to Southeast Asia including to Indonesia, it's actually transfer of occupational disease. Many workers in the electronic industry have died or are ill due to occupational health and safety. So the use of uh, toxic and hazardous chemical like the sulfon, including toluene that I mentioned earlier, it's, it's also deadly. Uh, you know, it's, uh, toluene is, can also infect the central nervous system, eye, skin, respiratory system, liver, and kidneys. The danger to young women of childbearing age is especially very acute, which is breathing high levels of toluene during pregnancy can result in birth defect and miscarriages. So lots of uh, birth defect cases and miscarriages cases that we found uh, uh, over the uh, five years we have uh, in our research uh, supported by the electronic watch uh, uh, between our organizations and electronic watch. So uh, I, I, let me put uh, several testimonies from the workers. This is from the electronic workers. Uh, there are uh, several testimonies. Uh, probably it's useful for, for us to reflect how uh, to know the situation at the workplace. Uh, Testoni one from, from a woman workers in one of the Samsung suppliers in, in, in Indonesia. She said, we inhale the toluene and feel dizzy. We use masks, but the masks are the normal thin mask, even though they are supposed to get us the proper gas mask. Some workers vomit. 
Sometimes when it is hot, we don't use mask. There's no air conditioning, only a fan. Many workers suffer from respiratory, uh, respiratory, respiratory illness and allergies. So there are lung disease and uh, difficulty in breathing. So I'll move to another uh, testimony. The second testimony from also from uh, women workers in, in electronic uh, factory. We had a worker who suffered from serious uh, respiratory illness. She was sent to hospital. There is no history of uh, respiratory illness in her family. It is clear the problem comes from the workplace. In the hospital, the doctor asked us, removing the hazard or providing work safety equipment. Uh, testing number three it is about excessive production targets. So uh, even we have a you know, union, even we have a, a freedom of associations, but often it is still uh, ch challenging to negotiate about how uh, the workers work decently. So still excessive production target is still mandatory and uh, uh, workers are uh, uh, got a problem with this situation. A testimony number four, this is the um, second just, last. Wait, wait, two more minutes, sorry if that's okay. Okay, sure, sure, thank you. About fainting, it's testimony number four, uh, the second last, uh, of, of, of fainting. Uh, probably you are familiar about the fainting uh, the, uh, in, in, in factory. Every day, three workers faint. Fainting happens because workers are tired or sick. And then this is the last one, uh, possessions. Uh, workers also sometimes possessed. Possessions do not happen as often as fainting, but it happens. So it's also a psychological. People are tired and... Uh, sometimes the possessions last 15 and 30 minutes and this, uh, this may be a myth, but it uh, happens a lot. So the last uh, slides I would uh, mention here, uh, misinformation uh, often mentioned by the company management. They said, you know, in one of the electronic production sites I visited that uh, they use a lot of uh, manganese, uh, it's produced uh, dust. So. The company said dust inhaled by the workers will go away when urinating. So this is inception. This is misinformation and this is wrong. So the sometimes uh, the management also say that occupational lung disease is uh, not coming from the workplace. It caused by because you are smoking cigarette or because you are suffering from tuberculosis. So this is uh, negligence and denial from the, the, the companies. Thank you, Dev. Uh, thank you. Terima kasih. This is my email. If you you want to have further questions, thank you. Over to thank you. you so much, Frami. Um, pretty sobering testimonies from, from workers there. Uh, we do have some questions, and what I'm going to do now is just we have 20 minutes. Um, I'll just start the questions. We'll, we'll see if any more come in, and we'll try and keep an eye on them. Uh, and I'm, I've got questions for all three speakers, so... Um, Probably to give Harry and Fami a rest, I'll go to one for your own first. But just to say, Harry and Fami, I've got questions for you as well. So let's, um, I think, just try and answer as many as we can. Um, you're in the first one, it's to yourself. And the question is um, Have the brands or lead firms that you mentioned, have they contributed anything positive to the trade union environment, do you think? In Indonesia? or generally? I think particularly Indonesia, but if you want to comment more, comment more generally. Um, I think in Indonesia, the brands are actually doing very little on, on trade union rights. Um, I have not come across any, any, any structural program that, that, that tries to address these issues in Indonesia. I think that on a factory level, uh, when problems of union busting arise, uh, there have been some cases whereby uh, through an organization like LIPS, maybe the brands have been involved to, 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 uh, and uh, been asked to intervene and correct or remediate uh, the violation. So 
I, I know from um, that, 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 that FAMI and LIPS are involved in Electronic Watch, which, which is a monitoring organization uh, uh, from public buyers and that, that tries to improve conditions in the electronics industry. Uh, so they, they, they use organizations on the ground to raise these kind of uh, topics. And then through the public buyers and through the uh, to pressuring the brands, uh, there might have been some some intervention on 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 uh, trade union rights. But I'm not sure in Indonesia if that happened a lot. I from from my work in in garments, I know this is quite common, uh, but I'm not sure if this this also happened with trade union trade union rights in Indonesia. But I think Fami could could possibly uh, uh, respond to that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jeroen. Fami, do you want to respond on that as well? Yeah, I think it's still very limited uh, intervention or uh, role by the, the public, uh, by the brand. Uh, and it started uh, when the electronic watch came in and tried to bring the brands to be responsible in this uh, sector. I think it's important. Uh, we learn from other sectors like a garment and textile where, you know, lots of intervention by the uh, different organizations and civil society and the workers groups to support the struggle of the workers at, the, at that sector. But still the electronic is still uh, very limited and uh, it's, it's a very, uh, contradictory because, you know, in terms of the occupational health and safety issues, electronic is even more uh, worrisome because of the use of the chemicals. I think it's important for those who can support this issue to be br uh, to bring the all the responsible uh, uh, organization or responsible parties to be. Uh, involved in resolving the, the situation in the sector. Uh, not only here in Indonesia, but also in uh, other countries. At least uh, in the regions of Asia, where I uh, uh, monitor closely. Thank you. Thank you. Harry, I've got a question for you. You might want to comment on that last topic as well, but the question was, and I shall mispronounce here so apologies this is the downside of being from from the uk where you only speak one language um can the metal industry that you mentioned be compared with the brazilian union vrs metals which was uh, i understand associated with lula da silva and which has been successful to some degree at least in institutionalizing the power that, uh, within a national scale so do you see do you see parallels with that and, and you also might want to comment on the previous discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you, Dave. It's a challenging question. Um, yes, uh, Brazil, Brazil and Indonesia might share some similar aspects, uh, but also have quite significant differences. Uh, when Brazil was ruled by the military regime in 1970s, Indonesia was also in the same condition. <clears throat> Both share similar orientation in the social economic changes as developing countries and the union and the union which appeared as one of the engines of movement is also the metal union. So it's a bit similar with the condition in, of Indonesia today. However, um, one of the significant differences is that the military regime in Brazil did not cross uh, the politics of working class base. Uh, even the leftist, the leftist movement still existed. So this makes uh, a fundamental difference uh, with Indonesia. So in in the in the colonial even in the colonial era and also in the early period of post colonial era, Indonesia had a strong trade union base. They were even much more radical than current unions. But after, after this month, 50 years, 55 years ago, a systematic destruction of any uh, left base was carried out 
by military faction with the support of many grassroots uh, movement, including the union, in, including the union base. So um, that was the process of depoliticization and the de-ideologization of any movements and all social organizations were converged and centralized into a single state control. So um, uh, currently, even though we might be impressed by the Brazilian movements, uh, the existing conditions are currently um, quite different. So if the grassroots uh, movements like church, students, uh, communities, indigenous movements in Brazil can be a good alliance in building a well-organized front, I don't think that will be the case in Indonesia. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions for Fami uh, I just want to pose and I'll, I'll ask both together Fami and hopefully you can remember the two. Um, the first one is, is there a concern by the companies that if better work conditions are provided, that the quality of the output will improve as well? So that's the first question. And the second, Sorry, Dave, can, can you repeat? Sorry. Certainly, yes. Um, and we can go to the question asked to, to, to add more if needed. Is there a concern by the companies that if better work conditions are provided, the quality of the output will improve as well? That was the question. And there's a second one, which is, you'd mentioned some of the chemicals. How successful is the union's work on the chemicals issue? So those are the two questions for FAMI. And if we have time, I'll probably ask um, Harry to come in as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, I still trying to, un sorry, I, I still don't get the question number one, whether uh, the company uh, are willing to provide the better conditions and so that the, the better uh, working condition can also improve the product activity of the workers, is that, is that the question or? Uh, yeah, I wonder if the person who asked the question who's on the call might want okay. to come in just to clarify. Do we know? Charlotte, do we know yeah. who asked? Okay, pr probably I'll, I'll uh, get the number, uh, question number two about the, how the workers are, uh, and the unions are, uh, taking part in the monitoring of the use of the chemicals. I think uh, it's, it's also a problem, uh, you know, like uh, the research uh, Yerun and Hari uh, is doing, it's, it's about the freedom of associations and, uh, and, the, and it's, it's uh, aspect. Uh, it's, it's related, of course, to uh, to the the right to the quality bargaining and and meaning it they the workers should be able to bargain on the on uh, the use of the chemicals but that's also related to the regulation the government regulations one uh, very weak control on the use of the chemicals uh, the the inflow the influx of the chemicals to the country is uh, uh, it's a, a staggering uh, amount uh, and then they have to be checked and the labs is very limited so the capacity of uh, laboratories to check uh, or for example in the case of Batam they have only one laboratory to check uh, thousands of uh, uh, chemicals enter to the to the islands for the production of the electronics so uh, that's the, the situation. So in short, uh, one, uh, workers are still, you know, uh, put the priority of wages, getting decent wages as a number one. And the occupational health and safety and the uh, toxic chemicals is priority number, maybe number seven. So that's that's the the problem. So uh, I, as I said uh, earlier, that you know the freedom of association is also you know a space where people are or different actors are struggling to you know to 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 limit uh, their uh, their enemies' space. Like the companies and governments are trying 
to to limit the space of the workers you know how how can the working conditions and the use of chemicals can be monitored if you know the decent wage is not exists if the wages is still uh, a problem and so people are, and workers are still you know focusing only on how to increase the wages that catching up the uh, uh, inflation things like that so okay. uh, that's my uh, response to uh, the I, second question on the first can question can I add, uh, a bit uh, to answer Please, this. Yeah, sorry Harry yeah yeah um, it's 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 interesting to 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 talk about the the way the and the workers and the unions um, in understanding the issue of this uh, uh, health and um, the safety, because when we when we uh, ask to the respondents to, to the workers and also the union to the unionists uh, about the uh, whether they experience on uh, or they know about the accidents of uh, the, in the workplace, mostly. They um, they think or they feel that the concept of accident is simply related to the physical accident. It's not related to the chemical accident. So uh, I think uh, even even the, the trade union is. So I think this is also important as well um, that the concept of accident itself it should it should be broadened and and also uh, uh, to be more critical in this case. While actually. The, the substance of uh, chemical is also the, the core substance in electronic industries. Thanks, thanks, Harry. I understand that it was uh, Vili Dries who asked the question that um, we were struggling to maybe completely understand. I don't know if Vili wants to come in and just um, say that question again. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, of course, uh, whether it's very important that the output uh, by uh, factories there is uh, quality, uh, as for quality, very good. Uh, but I can imagine if uh, workers are more healthy and more uh, working for a longer time, that their output may become also uh, more profitable and uh, with a higher quality. But uh, right. uh, I'm. I'm not sure about whether it's important for companies to have really high quality output. I yes, I agree. Uh, very very important questions, but unfortunately, that's not the case uh, because you know uh, the surplus of workforce here. You know, there there are medical checkup. The medical checkup uh, every year, but you know what? The medical checkups is conducted to check when the workers are very ill, and that's why the reasons to kick them out, the reasons to dismiss such uh, ill workers. So uh, the, the, with that's the problem of you know. Uh, huge unemployment uh, here, surplus of the workforce, and then the industry hire young female workers, and uh, so that's uh, that's uh, unfortunately the situation where the companies easily hire and easily fire the workers, so they don't care about improving the workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Fami. We're, we're getting to the point where we're running out of time, but I want to ask one question to all three speakers or, or slightly different question, but um, and, and we'll have to be brief. But uh, the, the question is, I guess, you know, you've, we, we've heard on the seminar, it's been absolutely fascinating and humbling for someone like me to hear about real life conditions and what's you know actually going on. So I guess my question to all three of you is if you had a message to, let's say, Western companies, or public buyers of, of public goods in, in the West, or even Western consumers. So, you know, if you could get a message to all public buyers or to public companies or, or to members of the public in the West, based on what we've heard, what would you want to say? So I'll go to Yeroen, 
and then Harry and then to Fami on that. And we only have three minutes, so people will have to be pretty, pretty sharp. Think like you're on the news and you've got a, you've got 15 seconds. What would you want to say? So over to Jeroen first. Um, so what, what I think companies should endorse freedom of association and adopt a positive approach to it. Right. So this is, this is a huge step to make for most electronic companies. Only a few, as the table of FAMI shows, uh, showed uh, companies that, that actually even talk to the global union on, on these type of topics. So that would be a first uh, important uh, step. I think uh, more is probably achieved by public pressure. So public pressure from individual consumers, and also collective consumers. And here, public procurement uh, is a very important uh, force for the good, in a sense, because they, they, they do um, source on a big scale and they are important clients to uh, these electronic brands. So absolutely, uh, public procurement organized through electronic watch or maybe other institutions could, could, could play a very important role. For individual consumers, I, I think that their, their, their role is probably quite limited, but they can still hold global corporations accountable to uh, joining uh, consumer actions uh, by trying to buy, uh, make ethical choices in, 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 in their so, uh, by pur purchasing decisions. Although I, I am a bit skeptical about now, how much impact that will have. But it's important that, that the global brands know consumers care. So. Okay. That's a good place to move on to. To Harry, thank you, Jeroen. Harry? Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I think we can also learn from the case of um, the labor condition in garment sector, especially, or in the uh, footwear, where um, there have been um, sweatshop uh, industries. So um, I don't think that uh, people, especially in the, in the West, um, really have uh, uh, detailed information about what is actually um, uh, taking place in the China or maybe in Vietnam or maybe in Indonesia uh, about the real situation of the production. So uh, having this kind of information uh, about the situation and then it it makes a kind of a, a good, a, a critical perception of the public. Uh, I still don't believe about the uh, the, break, the consumer boycotts, but at least at least uh, they have a, a critical information uh, regarding the production process um, that is spread uh, across the world. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, and where folks were at 10.30 and some of you may need to go, we will wrap up very soon, but I want to give the last word on this to, to Fami before I, I, I thank people. So Fami, um, if, briefly if you can, yeah, how would you respond to that huge question? Uh, thank you, Dev. Uh, there are different uh, groups and actors like uh, Good Electronics, Electronic Watch uh, initiated in uh, in, in uh, Western countries. And I think at least with these uh, two groups, and of course there are other Moors who have been trying to improve and who've been trying to advocate the rights of the workers. So I think the Western companies can listen to what they propose. They are, they are based on what they have found at the ground in the production countries, including in Indonesia. And uh, second, uh, I think uh, I would ask the companies to respect the labor rights. Uh, I want to tell you a short story about uh, how they don't respect our uh, the, the labor rights in Indonesia. One. Uh, once uh, there, there is a violation, they sent the inspector, a uh, professional inspector, professional audit, auditor, social auditor. And this auditor is still, uh, you know, uh, treated uh, unlike auditor, very respectful, but they uh, belittle 
and they try to hum humiliate and disrespect the, the workers while auditing. So this is such a embarrassing and such a, a shameful uh, from uh, the, the, the way the auditing done. And uh, this is, of course, only one aspect how the situations in electronic uh, sectors is uh, we are facing now. Thank you. Thank you, Dev. Thank you, Fami. And we could carry on, uh, folks, but we're out of time. I just want to mention and draw your to attention. There's a, a comment uh, in the in the in the comments box from Apriyani to everyone, and I would draw just draw your attention to that as well. But we don't have time to pursue that, I'm afraid, because we need to finish. Uh, and and I did say at the start, if you remember, my job was to make sure we got through this and finished on time, because no doubt many of you would have to dash off to somebody else. So. This is a huge topic. I really, I'm not sure enjoyed is the right word, but I really uh, valued listening to the contributions and hearing the research. So I want to thank Jeroen, Harry and Fami for, first of all, keeping to time, which is really helpful when you're the moderator, uh, but also to presenting such detailed and interesting and sobering information so clearly. I want to thank everybody who has made comments. I also want to thank Katapa for organizing this. So particularly Charlotte and Zatka in the background and Iris, who's, I can see the small drawing that's being done. I'd love to see it uh, properly soon. And obviously we've been supported by the European Union on this project, so thanks to the European Union. And finally, thanks to all of you for, for, for tuning in and joining us, what I think is a really important discussion. So thank you all very much indeed, and enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you again, and bye-bye. Thank you very much to you too, Dave, for this excellent moderation. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks.